Let me tell you a story. In the beginning, the galaxy was devoid of life. There were countless young stars and newly forged worlds around them, but nothing living, nothing aware. But look, over here, just now, life is beginning on Braconius too. And now, over there, on Thelius 9, and now Antares 3, spring is dawning upon the galaxy, and simple microbial life spontaneously blooms across the stars. Countless living worlds, and for a while, the galaxy quietly hums along with these oases of life, each one completely unaware of each other, or indeed, even themselves. Simple, self-replicating chemical entities, beautiful as they are, they are nothing more than that. After about a billion years or so, something changes. Some of these life forms develop complexity. Mutation and adaptation to constantly shifting conditions, ever more competitive siblings, and a bountiful supply of energy leads to some of these life forms to ponder their existence, to become self-aware, to study the world around them, to develop technologies that improve their odds of survival, and eventually to send out ships across the stars. The galaxy awakens. Some of these technological species, not all, but some, are compelled to spread their seed. Whether it be motivated by biological imperative, galactic imperialism, or an out of control artificial intelligence, some fraction of these technological species set up colonies on nearby stars. And those colonies, they themselves go on to also send out more colony ships. A wave of consciousness spreads forth, waking up the galaxy as it goes. And within a fraction of the galaxy's lifetime, even with ships traveling at pitiful sublight speeds, every habitable world is taken. Every planet with potential is transformed into another member of an interstellar network whose roots have now infested every nook and cranny of this once dormant galaxy. But that's just a story. It didn't happen here. The Earth is not an alien colony. Our very existence, our traceable lineage to four billion years of natural gradual evolution betrays this story. Professor Michael Hart, who was the first to formalize Fermi's paradox in 1975, famously referred to this as fact A. Often Fermi's paradox is cast in terms of a lack of radio transmission from another civilization. But that's actually easier to sidestep because maybe we just haven't been looking for long enough or wide enough or in the right way. But fact A is different because fact A is stubbornly resistant to optimism about a galaxy full of civilizations. So does this mean that intelligence has never before emerged in our galaxy? Could we be the first? Or perhaps there is another interstellar empire out there, just somehow it's not spread into all corners of the galaxy. Maybe with realistic assumptions about spacecraft range and speed, that that somehow prevents these galactic empires from ever emerging. For me, Fact A has always held a special kind of fascination. Maybe the right word should be dilemma. In a way, it's easy to overlook. It's the subtle fact that we exist that actually remarkably contains information about the cosmos. But it's also fundamentally jarring because it throws the Copernican principle, the idea that this is typical, civilization should be everywhere under the bus. Because the simplest explanation for fact A is that we are alone. 
Occam's Razor. You've ever heard of it? Uh, Occam's Razor? It sounds like some slasher movie. No, Occam's Razor. It's a basic scientific principle. And it says, all things being equal, the simplest explanation tends to be the right one. Makes sense to me. Now, it's not necessarily a desirable premise, but I think it's hard to argue that there exists a simpler explanation to fact A than the grim possibility that this may really be it. This is indeed the explanation that Hart suggested, but his idea was also criticized from others about some of the assumptions that were made. For example, perhaps the colony ships that these civilizations build have very limited range. Or perhaps they just rarely build these colony ships in the first place. Or maybe there are just so few habitable worlds out there that it's really not worth attempting to make the trip. Perhaps there are alternative explanations to fact A that don't require us to invoke a lonely universe scenario. But to investigate that, we would have to simulate the entire galaxy and vary all of these possible assumptions. Last January in Hawaii, I managed to sit down with Professor Jason Wright from Penn State University, who did exactly this. He recently co-authored a paper that attempts to solve Hart's paradox by simulating our vast galaxy with different civilizations and different assumptions in glorious three-dimensional detail with time evolution and even stellar motions. It's no exaggeration to say that Professor Jason Wright is one of the foremost researchers in the search for extraterrestrial intelligence today. He's also a highly accomplished and extremely productive exoplanet hunter. And so there is no one better to explain his work than himself. So I'm gonna hand you over now to Jason and then come back for some final closing thoughts at the end. So we like to talk about the Fermi paradox, which is uh, which started in 1950 when uh, the physicist Enrico Fermi was talking to some other physicists and he asked, where is everybody? And what he had in mind was, why aren't there aliens in the solar system right now? And it might seem like a weird question, but when you think about it like a physicist, it's actually a bit of a puzzle. And the argument is that the galaxy is really, really old and it's got a lot, a lot of stars. And so if any time in its history, which is about 10 billion years, a species arose that had interstellar space flight, um, they would be able to go to a nearby star and set up a settlement there. And that would take a long time, it's a very long journey, uh, but compared to the age of the galaxy, it's not very long. If that settlement forms another settlement and those settlements form even more settlements, then you'll get this explosive radiating growth and pretty soon every star in the galaxy will have settlements. And I say pretty soon, we mean like hundreds of millions of years, but that's much shorter than the age of the galaxy. So the question is, if that has happened, then why aren't they here? And if it hasn't happened, why not? There's been plenty of time for it to happen. Does that mean that we're the first species in the galaxy? So this is often called the Fermi paradox. I argue it's not really a paradox at all. It's because it makes a lot of assumptions. It makes assumptions like uh, the settlements will be very long lived. Essentially, once you have a settlement, it'll just keep producing these ships. It makes the assumption that it's possible to settle other stars. Science fiction tells us it is, but it might just be very hard to build a machine that can last in interstellar space and that no one does it. So um, this argument that the galaxy should get filled up has been analyzed by lots of authors over the past few decades. We, I thought it was just a few papers, but when we were writing this paper, we found dozens of papers where people have, either with a computer simulation or with pen and paper theory, tried to calculate how quickly the galaxy would fill. One thing that always bothered me about all of these calculations, there's only two papers that didn't do this, um, is that they either assume that stars don't move, they just assume some static substrate of stars and you're just asking, you know, how far do the ships go? Or they assume stars are two-dimensional and that you move along in this two-dimensional grid and you populate the whole thing because those are much simpler problems to solve. Uh, and I wanted to lift those assumptions. And so I was really pleased to work with Adam Frank and his team to uh, do a proper numerical simulation where we have a 3D set of stars and they're actually moving around. The reason it's important to let them move is that you know, we imagine Star Trek, you can move really fast if you have advanced technology. But the truth is, moving near the speed of light just seems really, really hard. Even for, you know, arbitrarily advanced technologies, you hit one little pebble and it's like a nuclear explosion. It seems much more likely to me that if there are interstellar ships, they move pretty slowly. 
um, and that you know they just take 10,000 or 100,000 years to get to their target. What that means is, once you set up a settlement, um, your ships aren't much faster than the stars around you. And that settlement will move through the galaxy and constantly encounter fresh stars that haven't been settled. And that this helps settle the galaxy. You don't need to do it with the ships. Because the stars are moving, the stars are your ships. And they take you all over the galaxy. So the stars in the Milky Way mostly move in a disk, mostly. Um, and they more or less move on circular orbits. They have a bit of in and out. Uh, but that's what most of the stars are doing. And then also, if you just look at a little region, the stars are all kind of buzzing around, like gas molecules or bees or something like that. So if one star were to have a settlement on it, the closest star to it keeps changing. And it moves around the galaxy. And so if, for instance, you can only settle the very nearest star, well, that nearest star changes every 100,000 years or something. And so if every 100,000 years they make a settlement on the nearest star, then those stars will go out and do the same thing. And they'll diffuse out at first. And so you'll get this diffusion of the stars moving out, carrying settlements with them. You zoom out a little bit, uh, and not all the stars move in the same velocity. That creates shear. So the outer parts um, go around less often than the inner parts. And the result there is that if you work outwards in the galaxy, then, then you explore a new set of stars moving it at a different angular velocity. And you go inwards and they get ahead. And over the time it takes the galaxy to rotate, which is hundreds of millions of years, it's sort of like you know stirring the jam in the porridge. You'll just see the settlements eventually cover the whole thing, even if the individual um, ships aren't very fast. It's not like they're crossing the whole galaxy themselves. They're just getting carried around by the stars. Even more interestingly, there are a lot of stars in the galactic halo. So these don't move in a disk. These are just everywhere. And they go in towards the center. They go out. They go every which way. They counter-rotate in the disk. If those are settleable, if you can put a settlement on one of those stars, um, then you encounter fresh stars much, much more quickly. And we ran some simulations where one halo, we got all the stars moving along like they normally do, and one halo star goes backwards through them. And there's just this wake of settlements behind it. So the motions of the stars make settling the galaxy much, much easier. Uh, and that, as they say, sharpens the Fermi paradox. It means it's much easier to populate the whole galaxy than some of the more naive earlier models. So um, we didn't want to make a lot of assumptions about how aliens settle other systems or alien technology. So instead of assuming something specific, we tried a whole range of different possibilities. So some of the things we considered were how long a typical settlement lasts, Maybe they only last 100 years, maybe they last 100 million years, uh, over which time they're sending out these ships. Also, maybe sending out ships is super hard. It's something that you know, some really ambitious settlement only attempts every 100,000 years, or every million years. Or maybe they do it very frequently, maybe it's every 10,000 years. So that's another knob. We also looked at the probe range. We didn't want to assume that you could have a, a probe or a settlement ship that would last a million years in space. Uh, and so we picked some, we, a range of distances to see, well, what if they can only go about four light years, the distance basically to the nearest star to the sun. Maybe they go 40, maybe it's 400. So one of the, the coolest ones that we varied, actually, was the fraction of, settle, of stars that are settleable. Um, we didn't assume that every star in the galaxy was a potential place a settlement could be. So there's a lot of reasons that it might not be OK. Um, it could just be that there aren't any good planets to settle on, so why would you go there? But another neat one, and we call this the Aurora effect, after the novel by Kim Stanley Robinson, is that maybe the planet you would settle is already inhabited, and that there are good reasons not to settle a planet that already has life on it. I, I really like this idea because it runs contrary to a lot of like science fiction narratives that argue that they would want to come to the Earth exactly because there's life here and we have resources that they would want. But that assumes it's a very natural tendency to see something someone else has and take it from them. And who knows, maybe that's like completely contrary to the way that uh, any, any spacefaring civilization would behave. So we have a fraction of stars in the galaxy that are actually worth settling. And what that means, if that's very low, then you have to wait a long time before one comes into range that you can settle, and that slows down um, the propagation of the settlement front considerably. So we didn't make just one assumption about how they behaved. We, made, we tried lots of different assumptions, and then we mapped out the results of those assumptions. So what we found was, when you have very short-lived civilizations, their lifetime is much less than how often they send out ships, then they just never send out ships. And so no matter how many pop up, they never spread. And so the galaxy ends up basically sterile. And we get almost 0% of the stars in the galaxy that have settlements. 
On the other hand, if they're very long lived, let's say, you know, they live, you know, millions of years, and they set out settlement ships every 10,000 years, then every settlement is reproducing itself quite often. And we quickly get that the galaxy is completely filled with these settlements. Interestingly, um, there's a, this region in between where you get really neat phenomena. So, for instance, if you have uh, probe ranges that are short, and you can only settle the very closest star that happens to come by, then even if you want to send out a lot of ships, you can't because you just don't have the range. And so you end up with these little pockets where you know you settle only occasionally when it comes by. And then on top of that, if you add that the settlement lifetimes aren't as long as it takes new stars to come in, you just get these little pockets where stars settle each other occasionally and they just barely hang on. So in that case, you can actually have little systems of stars that are all coming from the same place and having been settled um, all over the galaxy, but most of the galaxy is unsettled. And then, yes, we find, of course, that if you do settle the whole galaxy, it looks just like uh, Fermi imagined. It looks like this big explosive radiating growth across the entire galaxy. I, I try to have really um, broad priors about the search for extraterrestrial intelligence. I'm perfectly willing to believe that there's nothing out there. Um, and I'm perfectly willing to believe that the galaxy is just endemic with technology waiting for us to discover it. Um, what this research did for me is it, is it helped highlight the assumptions that are underlie people's beliefs that they, you know, that they know there's nothing out there or that there's a lot of things out there. And so now when people talk about the Fermi paradox and say everyone should be out there, we can say, okay, everyone should be out there. Every, you know, all the stars should have settlements if you believe settlements would last this long. And you can tell them exactly what it is that they're assuming. And I think that helps quantify the assumptions behind SETI and, uh, and you know, help inform what maybe we should believe. But personally, um, yeah, my personal belief is that I just, I don't want to make any guesses. I want to look, I want to see. And I want to know, uh, I want upper limits. I want to determine from data what it looks like out there without imposing my personal unjustified beliefs on whether they're out there or not. Okay, so having heard about this exciting work of simulating galactic colonization in sophisticated detail, let's come back to my dilemma. What does fact A truly tell us about our place in the universe? What solutions can we now see to be viable given the new work that Jason has worked on? I think that this plot from the paper which I want to highlight was led by Dr. Jonathan Carol Nellenbach, is perhaps the key diagram to take away. What we're looking at here is the probability of getting fact A. Red regions are those where you're essentially guaranteed to get fact A. The Earth is not colonized. Blue regions depict the opposite. Regions where it's incredibly unlikely that you'd get fact A. The X and Y axes are varying key assumptions about the model. The x-axis is the fraction of settleable stars out there in the galaxy. So the upper end corresponds to multiple settleable worlds per star, whereas the lower end corresponds to a galaxy almost devoid of settleable systems. It's also worth noting that in that case, not only are settleable systems rare, but by proxy, so are civilizations, since they have to be born on one of these settleable systems in the first place. The y-axis here corresponds to how long typical spacefaring colonies last. In other words, how long do they send ships out for, which varies here from 100 years up to 100 million years. Now remember that this red region represents an almost 100% probability of getting fact A, whereas the blue region depicts an almost 0% probability of getting fact A. And so since we know that fact A is true, then we must live somewhere in the red region. In other words, we can use this plot to figure out the plausible range of these input parameters. So let's look closely at this blue exclusion zone. This essentially tells us that a scenario where roughly every star has a settleable planet around it is excluded. And that's true no matter what we assume for their lifetimes. 
Since being a settleable planet is a prerequisite for a civilization such as our own to naturally emerge on these planets, then this fact in turn implies that the idea of a universe in which most stars at some point in their history get a civilization around them is somewhat unlikely. And that already is a profound statement. The red region is the allowed zone, which you can see spans scenarios with low settleable worlds and or short civilization lifetimes. You can sort of do either and explain away fact A quite naturally. There's also this intriguing in-between zone, which is neither likely nor unlikely, and so we could plausibly live here too. This is the transitional zone, where you get the sort of effervescent behaviour that Jason described, where civilizations pop up just long enough to send out a couple of ships, and then die off. Now this is a really fascinating prospect, but for me personally, the very narrow width of this part of the parameter corridor that you see is a little bit troubling. And this is because it makes the solution appear very finely tuned. And in general, physicists don't much like finely tuned solutions. That's because they appear somewhat contrived in nature. And so my best guess would be that we would live somewhere in that red bulk of parameter space. Even so, this perhaps gives us some hope. It's possible that interstellar civilizations do sometimes pop up. It's just that each colony doesn't last for more than a million years or so. Ironically, although they may have spread to the stars to increase their odds of survival, these colonies just don't persist. Or alternatively, they just eventually stop sending out ships for whatever reason. Or maybe the answer really is the simple one, that we are simply alone. Bit by bit, there is a picture emerging that the galaxy is not teeming with advanced civilizations. They can still plausibly exist, but their reach is finite. Yet what's exciting to me is that whether it be through fact A, SETI, or astrobiology work, we are slowly chipping away at this most profound of questions. So let me know your opinion down below in the comments. Do you think that there are galactic spanning empires out there? Or do you look up and see a lonely, serene galaxy? Until the next video, stay thoughtful and stay curious. Personally, I don't want to make any guesses. I want to look. I want to see. I want to determine from data what it looks like out there without imposing my personal unjustified beliefs.